Shalom and welcome to another episode of GMS Mailbag, here to feed the elect through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashim Yahushai. Now in this lesson I'm going to call it the old and the new. And it's based upon the King James Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now the inspiration of this uh, video came to me when I watched this video by... Uh, uh, GMS Avenger for Yahweh Shai. This is our, our GMS brother um, Yakanan. And he did an expose on this guy here. This guy here, he goes by the name Nasi Yashuv El. I believe that's how he would say it. Uh, seems he had a debate. This character here had a debate with uh, General Seti. <laughs> and. Uh, pretty much destroyed Seti, as the word goes, uh, in their debate, and he does not believe in the New Testament. He simply believes in the Old Testament, and that's the inspiration of this lesson. Now, uh, this guy, he uh, admitted, according to the video, he admitted that he was a student or that he's a student of uh, Malachi Z. York, which means uh, he's probably definitely connected because uh, Dr. Malachi Z. York is definitely connected to the shadow, uh, the shadowy elite, or the shadow elite. And as you see him sit here, he has his hands in the posture of... Uh, the Masonic posture of uh, the Vesica Pisces. It also goes under the name uh, Steeplin. Goes under very, you know, a lot of different names. But one of the foremost is uh, the Vesica Pisces. So, could this guy be connected? There's a good chance he may. A lot of these guys you see popping up, especially in the so-called Egyptology community. You know, they're popping up like popcorn. A lot of these guys are connected to the shadow elite. You know, a lot of them are connected to individuals who are connected to individuals who are connected to individuals of the shadow elite. So either way they're connected, you know, so they 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 have their own different spin on, you know, topics concerning the Bible. So that's this guy's story basically. So, you know, our brother Yakanan did an expose on him. You can go check out the video. But my, uh, my inspiration of this video is to show you, brothers, that the Bible, unlike... See, this is why the Lord said that we are to be perfect. You know, it is written in the book of Matthew 5 and 48, Be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is, these are the words of Yahweh Shai. Yahweh Shai said that. So, again, it is written... 1 Corinthians 2 and 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. So the, the desired object of this knowledge, this truth, is to become perfect. So this guy, is, you know, even though he defeated Seti, which is not really a monumental achievement, in my words, you know, I'm sure in the words of a lot of learned GMS brothers, because Seti is really a clown, you know, to, to put it mildly, Seti's nothing but a clown but anyway um, you know you have to become perfect in this knowledge and obviously this guy lacks perfection this is why he doesn't deal with the New Testament but just the Old Testament so anyway let's go into it uh, the first scripture you want to bring out to prove because it's all about proving, right? You know, it's not just what you know, but what you can prove. Is it not written, prove all things? All right, so the first scripture you want to bring out is the book of Matthew 15, I'm sorry, 13 and 52. Now these, again, these are the words of Yahweh Shai. Now we know Yahweh Shai spoke nothing but truth. He was a man of truth. A lot of times, Yahweh Shai would say, Verily, verily, I say unto you. When you look up that word verily, you know, from the Latin veritas, which means true. All right, so 
Yahweh Shai say, saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? The them meaning the apostles. They said unto him, Yea, Lord, meaning they understood. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed into the kingdom of heaven, and that's us, the, those of us that are coming into this truth, into this knowledge, into this understanding, we are likened unto the scribes who have been instructed unto the kingdom of heaven. Again, Yahweh said, the kingdom of heaven dwelleth within us. So what dwells within us? Our spirit. So these words we're learning is essentially the doorway to the kingdom of heaven. All right. So it says, therefore, every scribe which is instructed, another word for instructed is taught unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder. Now that man that is in the householder, the household is what? The owner of the house. So now who would be the owner of the house of the nation of Israel? Well, beginning with Yahweh, beginning with the man Yahweh. Why Yahweh Shai? All right, so the man that's like unto uh, that's like unto an householder would be Yahweh why Yahweh Shai, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. Now this knowledge is also known as treasure. All right, if you go in the book of Romans, I believe it's the eleven, the eleventh chapter. Uh, I'm not clear on the verse right now, but oh, eleventh chapter and the thirty-third verse. It clearly tells you that this knowledge is likened unto riches, unto silver, gold. So this is like the treasure, this knowledge. Then it says things new and old. So you're going to learn about things that are new, and you're going to learn about things that are old. Now, that brings to mind the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Now, if we were to go in the Greek, examine this verse in the Greek, you'll see that the new is, isn't is really actually new. It's, it's really a revamping of the old based upon the Greek word that is there. And the Greek word that is there is kainos. All right? I've gone through this many times, and the word simply means to, be, to make fresh. So it is something that was of old, made fresh, and it became new. So this thing has always been... Even the New Testament has always been dealing with the Old Testament. That's the point. As a matter of fact, when Yahweh came on the scene as Yahweh Shai, as you know, the New Testament wasn't even written yet. So what did Yahweh Shai taught from when he did teach? He taught from the Old Testament. All right? It just so happens that the history of Yahweh Shai and then later the apostles and then later Peter and then later... Well, not Peter, but Paul, and then later the men that were underneath Paul, all that history had to be written somewhere. Well, all that history was comprised in something called the New Testament. And we had to learn about that history, pursuant to Romans 15 and 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. So we had to learn about that history. So we find that history not in the Old Testament. We find that history in the New Testament. But they all combined together. So, so you get a well-rounded aspect of the Bible, all right? So again, if we go back to Matthew 15 and 32, it says, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure, and this is our treasure, things new and old. So you have the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. I mean, simple enough scripture you know, and it <laughs> brings home the point. Now, the next scripture is uh, the book of uh, Songs of Solomon, the seventh chapter. We're going to read the ninth to the thirteenth verse. Now, you will also find this book under the name Canticles, all right, which comes from the Latin word, or actually the Italian word, uh, cantare, which means to sing. Like, uh, if you say I sing, you would say io cantare, or if you, or if you would say you sing, you say tu canti, tu canti, you know, tu canti, you sing. So this book would go under the name Canticles. All right. If you don't see Songs of Solomon, 
you would see canticles and canticles means singing or songs so now if we go into the book of songs of solomon seventh chapter 9 to the 13 verse it says in the roof of now keep in mind this is basically a, a written in a poetic parabolic form and all you have to know is what certain allegories and symbols mean and you get the understanding of what is, is being said here and the roof of thy mouth was like the best wine for my beloved that goeth down sweetly causing the lips of those that are asleep to speak and that's basically this knowledge is like fine wine you know and it's and it's from like it says here and the roof of thy mouth like the best wine from my beloved is from Yahweh Bashim Yahushai, which is our beloved. All right. Reading on, it says, "I am my beloved's, I am my beloved's, and his de desire is toward me, and his desire is toward me." Uh, Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Now, the field would represent like the world. So when we go out there and teach those of us brothers that are set up around the world we're going into the field we're going into the field to do work what is the work to propagate this word to teach this knowledge to help gather the elect that's why we're out there so it says come my beloved let us go forth into the field let us lodge in the villages let us get up early to the vineyards to go and do the work there's also a parable in the New Testament where it speaks about the vineyard. Those that go out to labor in the vineyard shall receive wages. Let us see if the vine flourish. Again, the vine goes back to the wine, which goes back to this word, which goes back to this knowledge, this understanding. Whether the tender grape appear, the same thing, and the pomegranates bud forth. All, all these uh, terms here, pomegranates, grape, Vine. These are all uh, uh, allegories and symbols that go back to the word, that parabolically mean the word. All right. So it says, uh, whether the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth, there will I give thee my loves, meaning more understanding. The mandrakes, again, mandrakes, pomegranates, vine, they're all allegories and symbols for the word. The mandrakes give a smell, and at, and at our gates are all manner of pleasant fruits, which is the understanding of this knowledge, all right? Which is pleasant to those that are learned. It's very pleasant, all right? And it's like fruit, like you've heard the term, the fruit of knowledge, all right? Are all manner of pleasant fruits new and old which I have laid up for thee O my beloved now who's the Lord's beloved well the elect of the nation of Israel so the Lord have laid up for us all manner of pleasant fruits new and old now the key word there is for his beloved and we have found out not every Israelite is the Lord's beloved like this guy he's an Israelite but evidently he's not the Lord's beloved because if he was he would deal with the Old Testament which he do, he does deal with the Old Testament but he would act, he would deal with the Old and the New Testament combined All right so for you Israelites that don't you only deal with the Old Testament but you don't deal with the New Testament then evidently you're not the Lord's beloved because the Lord said he have laid up for his beloved all men of pleasant fruits, new and old. All right, so that is another scripture that you can uh, jot down to go with uh, uh, Matthew 15 and, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew 13 and 52. And notice Matthew 13 and 52 is written in the New Testament. And this scripture I just read here, Songs of Solomon, the seventh chapter, the 13th verse, which is also known as Canticles, is written in the Old Testament. See? See how they connect? Now here's another example of this. If we go in the book of Psalms 40 and 7, it says, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. 
Now, this is speaking about Yahweh Shai. And I took a look at that word volume. It literally means roll of uh, pages or roll of parchment. Because before the Bible was a book, it was a parchment roll. All right? As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I have it here. If you look up the word volume in dictionary.com, it, say, it says a collection of written or printed sheets bound together and constituting a book. See, you never thought to look up the word volume now, did you? Neither did I. <laughs> and by looking it up, I gained a lot more insight to this word. That's why it's good to look up your words, you know. A collection of written or printed sheets bound together and constituting a book. So out of these printed sheets, which were also known as scrolls, came this book. Now this word Bible means a collection of books. You know, some people believe that the Bible is just one book. No, it's a collection of books, which were at one time a collection of sheets. Hence the word volume. Now I did find something interesting. Yeah, down here, to prove my point, down here the Latin for the word volume, volumen, roll of sheets. See it? Roll of sheets. So, when, oh, when down here it says history or historical, which is where the word historically came from, volumen, a roll of uh, papyrus, parchment, or the like. So that's what the word literally means. Volume literally means roll of sheets. That's what it means. So, if we go back to the scripture, what Yahweh Shai said, Then said I, Lo, or look, behold, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. So the whole book, which was one, at one time roll of sheets, was written of Yahweh Shai. So the spirit of Yahweh Shai is in the whole book, the New Testament, as well as the Old Testament. And again, you see the same scripture. Now this is in the Old Testament, Psalm 40 and 7 is written in the Old Testament, and you see the same scripture written in the New Testament, Hebrews 10 and 7. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O Yahweh. All right, so basically they're saying the same thing. Psalms 40 and 7, which is in the Old Testament, Hebrews 10 and 7, which is in the New Testament. Can you see the connection between the Old and the New? So for someone to say that the old says something different from the new or the new says something different from the old shows that they are unlearned and shows that the spirit of Yahweh Shimei Ashai is not dealing with them. Alright? Now, what I found out concerning the Bible, since we're talking about the Bible, before you had something called a new well, not new, but before you had something called the King James Version of 1611, you had something called the Geneva Bible. Now, doing some research, I found out that the Geneva Bible was the foremost or the premier model that was used to inspire the King James Version. As, in a, as a matter of fact, let's read it over here. Now, this is taken from a site... It's exiled. It is taken from a site, English Bible History. It's like a timeline dealing with uh, different Bibles and when they came on the scene. It goes as far back as 1415, the Wycliffe Bible, and uh, there you see an illustration of John Wycliffe, which I'm pretty sure you, you may have may have been a, you know. It may have been a re this may have been a result of iconoclasm. May have been. <laughs> Any man that was in interest in the Bible, you know, he didn't look like no so-called white man. <laughs> Case in point, King James. King James didn't look like no so-called white man. King James was a so-called black man. But anyway, um, concerning the 
Let's read, let's read a little excerpt dealing with something called the Geneva Bible, which helped to inspire the King James Bible. It says, the New Testament, this is uh, the Geneva Bible now. now. The Geneva Bible goes back to uh, a place called Geneva in uh, Switzerland. It says, the New, New Testament was completed in 1557, and the complete Bible was first published in 1560. Now, 51 years later it would come the King James Bible. It became known as the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible was the first Bible to add numbered verses to the chapters so that referencing specific passages would be easier. And uh, we can attest to that those of us that deal with the Bible today, it's a lot easier to deal with the Bible than it was back in ancient past. All right, because the chapters have been codified, the verses have been uh, numbered. It's something very different than, say, in Yahweh's day or in the day of the ancient prophets. And all that was done to make the word or to make the teaching of the word a lot easier for uh, the students that would come later in the, you know in later history which that being us so it's all part of the most high's plan yahweh bashim yahshai's plan to help push his word and to help teach his word uh read on it says um the geneva bible is also considered the first english study bible um read here. The Geneva Bible was the first Bible to add numbered verses to the chapters so that referencing specific passages would be easier. Every chapter was also accompanied by extensive marginal notes and references. Uh, the Geneva Bible is also considered the first English study Bible. William Shakespeare quotes hundreds of times in his plays from the Geneva translation of the Bible. The Geneva Bible, which proves William Shakespeare was a Jake. You know, he was very much interested in the Bible. You know, his uh, image, image, the image of William Shakespeare also has undergone uh, iconoclasm. Uh, the Geneva Bible became the, the Bible of choice for over 100 years of English-speaking Christians, which were Jakes, which were uh, Jakes that lived in England. Around, pretty much around this time, there was a lot of Jakes living in England, a lot of so-called Negroes, you know, the tribes, Judah, Benjamin, Levi. Uh, between 1560 and 1644, at least 144 editions of this Bible were published. That's the Geneva Bible. Examination of the 1611 King James Bible shows clearly that its translators were influenced much more by the Geneva Bible than by any other source. And I showed you the website. You had Bibles that were went clear back to the 1400s. All right. So they're telling you here that the Geneva Bible inspired the the uh, scholars who got together to help put together something called the King James Bible, which came 51 le years later from the Geneva Bible. All right, now let's see what we can find about the King James Bible. All right, the King James Bible. Now, in the interest of time, I am um, just going to get to the highlighted parts. Uh, it says here, they knew that the Geneva Version, which goes back to the Geneva Bible, had won the hearts of the people because of its excellent scholarship accuracy and exhaustive commentary. So again, this is the number one reason why the Bible, why King James used the Geneva Bible to inspire his work of his then would be called King James Bible. Essentially, the leaders of the church desired a Bible for the people, and that was all part of the knowledge of uh, the plan, I should say, of Yahweh Bashim Yahshai in years later to teach the Bible, teach the truth, you know, so we could learn who we are in the latter time, and also we could, the devil, the wicked, could be revealed. 
because that's part of prophecy that the wicked is going to be revealed by the Bible before he goes down. And the wicked is a so-called white man. He calls himself so-called white man today, but he's known in the Bible as the Edomites. All right, it says, uh, this translation to end all translations, and that's what it was touted as. It was touted as the King James Bible was touted as the translation to end all translations. All right. For for a while at least, and it held up to that name as you uh, or that uh, phrase as you as you as you're gonna see. Uh, for a while at least was the result of the combined effort of about fifty scholars. They took into consideration the Tyndale New Testament, the Coverdale Bible, the Matthews Bible, the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, and even the Reims New Testament. The great, the great revision of the Bishop's Bible had began from 1605, and keep in mind, out of all these Bibles mentioned, the Tyndale, the Matthews, the Coverdale, the one that inspired King James the most was the Geneva Bible. And the reason why, as it tells you here, is because of its scholarship, its accuracy, and its commentary. All right, so from 1605 to 1606, the scholars engaged in private research, so they did their research. Undoubtedly, they checked into the Hebrew, all right, and the Latin, and the Greek, mainly the Hebrew and the Greek, to help put together this thing called the King James Bible uh, from 1607. And the reason why I'm bringing this out, too, concerning the Bible, the going back into the past history of the Bible is to show that they did not omit the New Testament. They put together the old with the new. So, you know, who is some guy to say, oh, we just deal with the New Testament or the Old Testament, we don't deal with the new. And primarily, this character here, if I just segue from this for a minute, this character here, um, he's pretty much following the so-called Jew because the so-called Jews, they don't believe in the New Testament. And the main reason they don't believe in the New Testament is Revelation 2 and 9. It condemns them. All right? So, you know, this guy is totally confused. But anyway, getting back to this now. I'm about to wrap this up. Let's see. Uh, from 1605 to 1606, the scholars engage in private research. So as you can see, it's very important to do your research. From 1607 to 1609, the work was assembled. In 1610, the work went to press. And in 1611, the first of the huge 16-inch tall pulpit folios known today as the 1611 King James Bible. So as you can see, there was a lot of work that went into this King James Bible. So we, we can't take this thing for granted. And you got this guy, this fucking guy polite talking about, oh, the white man gave you that Bible and all these so-called Egyptology pundits that don't know their ass from the elbow talking shit about the Bible. They don't, they don't even know the Bible. Some of them, a lot of them couldn't even define the word Bible, correctly define the word. They're talking shit about the Bible. But as you can see, there was a lot of preparation a lot of work went into putting together this Bible. Pretty much from 1605 to 1611. Almost, what, six years, almost seven years went into the preparation of this King James Bible. All right? And the work paid off because there's a part here. Um, let me see if I get to it. Yeah, here it is down here. Show you that the work that King James put in this Bible paid off. It says, nevertheless, the King James Bible turned out to be an excellent... Now, remember, it was touted as uh, the translation to end all translations. That's, that was the tagline to the King James Bible. It says, nevertheless, the King James Bible turned out to be an excellent and accurate translation. And it became the most printed book in the history of the world. Now, that's not by man's doing. That's by the doing and power of Yahweh Shai, man. Because that is the word of Yahweh Shai. 
I mean, everybody have their word. You know, you can go online, you can hear the words of Muhammad Ali. You can hear the words of uh, uh, some singer-songwriter. <laughs> you can hear the words of some actor. So you mean to tell me that the creator that created heaven and earth, him and his only begotten son, they don't have their words? That their words is not uh, written, that their words that was spoken is not written down somewhere? Of course it is. It's called the Bible. Nevertheless, the King James Bible turned out to be an excellent and accurate translation, and it became the most printed book in the history of the world, and the only book with one billion copies in print. In fact, for over 250 years, and I should uh, insert in here that if you want to look at the New York Times bestseller list, the Bible is always number one. All right? In fact, for over 250 years until the appearance of the English Revised Version, I wonder why it was revised. <laughs> the King James Version r reigned without much of a rival. So that was, that's an excellent, uh, excellent um, uh, work that was done by King James. And because of his work, you see what happened. His, his Bible went on to be for over 250 years, went on to be the number one Bible on the planet Earth. And it was based upon the Geneva Bible, which the Geneva Bible in itself was a popular among the people. All right, so there's a lot of history to our book called the Bible. All right, and um, I thank the Most High, Yahweh Shemi I was able to find this information and to bring it out to your brothers. And at the same time to prove the validity of not just the old, but the Old and New Testament. All right, so with that, pretty much, um, you know, it's the end of the lesson, and uh, hopefully you brothers, you GMS brothers, learned something. Uh, yes, we deal with the Old as well as the New Testament. Why? Because it's the complete Bible. As it is written, the Lord said he comes in the volume of the book. So, this is GMS Mailbag, here to feed the elect through the spirit and power of Yahweh Hashem Yahshai, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Shalom.